long, hard fight over generations. So, introducing myself, as I said, my name is Lillian Ford Feckert. I was born almost 150 years ago in Brooklyn, New York, so I'm not a Jersey girl. But in 1902, at the ripe old, and I do mean ripe old age for those days of 25, I got married to a New York City banker named Edward Feckert, and he shortly became a New Jersey banker, and we moved from Brooklyn to Plainfield. And the first few years of the marriage, I was a typical suburban housewife involved in making a home with my church, with the temperance union in the area, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, women's clubs. But uh, in the late, uh, in about 1908, I joined the Women's Suffrage Association in the area. And in 1910, I was recruited to be the enrollment chair for the state. And for the next 10 years, I would, as my husband said, eat, drink, and sleep woman suffrage. But of course, the suffrage fight did not start with me. Indeed, 101 years before I was born, Abigail Adams wrote a letter to her husband, who was a delegate at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And in that letter, she said, and by the way, in the new laws, I desire you would remember the ladies do not put such unlimited power into their husbands. Remember all men would be tyrants if they could. She went on to state if particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies. We are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Despite the fact that this was basically what the delegates were saying to King George, he wrote back that she was so saucy and the new laws of the new nation would not be particularly female friendly. With one interesting exception, three months later, the Provincial Con uh, Congress of New Jersey ratified a constitution stating that all inhabitants of the colony of full age who were worth 50 pounds proclamation money would be entitled to vote for represent representatives. By not explicitly stating white male, it implicitly enfranchised some women, blacks, and aliens. Now, not all women were enfranchised because of that property requirement. While that property requirement wasn't large, married women under common law were property. They couldn't own property. But widows and single women could, and after the war, there were many of those. Some historians have, have thought that that constitution was accidental, that the wording was written in haste because the British were on, uh, on the shores of New Jersey at the time. But uh, laws were passed in 1790 and 1797, and a letter from a legislator in 1800 all use gender inclusive language, his or her. Uh, our constitution gives this right to maids or widows, black or white. So it was clearly not an accident. And newspapers were quite effusive. You can see some of these things, you know. May they stand unrivaled in their love of freedom and justice and so forth, the fair daughters of America. Some of them even spoke out in, in poetry, the Sentinel of Freedom in Newark, enthused now one and all proclaim the fall of tyrants open wide your throats and welcome in the peaceful scene of government in petticoats but not everybody was pleased a so-called friend of the ladies wrote in the trenton true american female reserve and delicacy is incompatible with the duties of an elector a female politician is subject to ridicule we don't know how many women actually voted because most voting records are lost, but some detective work done by uh, researchers from the Museum of the Revolution in Philadelphia recently uncovered some rolls from Montgom uh, Montgomery Township in Somerset County, and they found that about 7.8% of the names on those rolls were female. And at least one African American, he was, uh, his property was listed as one cattle and one dog. I don't know what one cattle is, but there it is. But all good things must come to an end. And in February of 1807, there was a uh, an election in Essex County for a location of a courthouse, but the fraud was rampant. Many more votes were cast than were eligible voters. And one of the accusations were that men were dressing up as women and voting multiple times. 
Well, instead of prosecuting those election-stealing cross-dressers, the all-male legislature passed a law to reinterpret New Jersey's Constitution, stating no person shall vote for officers unless such person be a free white male citizen of 21 years. Uh, worth 50 pounds. Uh, by this act, which was illegal, you can't actually amend a constitution by a law, but that didn't seem to stop anybody. Uh, women and blacks in New Jersey were disenfranchised. And uh, in 1844, the Constitution would be officially amended to state that as well. There's a whole article on these petticoat electors also in that Garden State legacy issue. Well, women didn't start speaking out for themselves. Instead, they got very active in the abolition movement, and both black and women got involved in the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, which was established in the middle of the 1830s. And that was um, run by Lucretia Coffin Mott, who, along with her husband, attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London as delegates, where they met Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her brand new husband, who were there, interesting way to spend a honeymoon, uh, Elizabeth was not a delegate, but it didn't matter because Lucretia and Elizabeth were both consigned to the spectators gallery along with every other woman present, allowed to see but not participate, which infuriated them. Elizabeth Cady Stanton would later note that they walked home arm in arm from that first day, resolving to hold a convention on the rights of women as soon as they returned uh, to, uh, to America. Well, it as soon would turn out to be eight years, primarily because Elizabeth kept having babies and moving around. But finally in 1848, Lucretia Mott was visiting upstate New York. Uh, her sister lived there. And um, there was a tea party. I like to call it the second tea party in American history. And at that tea party, Elizabeth, Lucretia, and three other women uh, all started griping about the condition of women, and they resolved to hold that convention less than two weeks hence in the neighboring town of Seneca Falls. And because it was right around the time of the 4th of July, they co-opted many of the words from the Declaration of Independence for their own document, opening up with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. They then went on to passed 12 resolutions um, involving things like uh, women having control of their own wages, of the property brought into the marriage, of the custody of their children in the case of a drunk or spendthrift husband, because in those days husband, uh, children were in entirely the custody of, of the husband. The most controversial of all of these was the right to vote. Uh, many people, including Lucretia Mott, thought it was too big an ask. She said to Elizabeth, thee will make us ridiculous. But Frederick Douglass, the only African American in attendance, supported Elizabeth, stating that without the vote, all of the other rights are moot. Well, that led to a decade of uh, political activity, annual conventions. The first national one was held in 1850 in Worcester, Massachusetts, and at that convention, Lucy Stone spoke, and Antoinette Brown, her friend from Oberlin, were, was in the audience. Both Lucy and Antoinette had studied Greek and Latin in college. To find out whether the uh, prohibition of women speaking in public was actually in the Bible, as ministers proclaimed. And they found that in the original language, the prohibition was against idle chatter in church, not serious public debate. Antoinette uh, would go on to become the first female ordained minister in this country, and Lucy became a national speaker for abolition, temperance, and women's rights, and spoke out eloquently at this convention. Who's in the audience? Susan B. Anthony. The following year, Susan will be introduced to uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton by Amelia Bloomer, the woman who we know uh, Bloomers, the, the uh, costume those with, with pantaloons. She, uh, Amelia Bloomer was the publisher of the Lily, uh, a, a women's magazine, and published those patterns, and her name became associated with it. But in any event, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton have a um, a partnership. Elizabeth writes the speeches because she's stuck at home with what will eventually be seven children. Susan, a single woman, rents the halls, takes them on the road, and as Elizabeth's husband quipped, Susan stirred the puddings, Elizabeth stirred up Susan, and then Susan stirs up the world. It will happen for fi over 50 years.
But in the mid-1850s, Lucy and Antoinette marry brothers, so they, uh, the Blackwell brothers, and they move to New Jersey, both of them. And they're both very progressive. Lucy even uh, keeps her own name, so women who follow her examples get called Lucy Stoners. And uh, Reverend Antoinette has seven children, but her, uh, they all become brown Blackwells, and her husband helps with housework and child care. In any event, Lucy in 1857 buys a farm in Orange, New Jersey with her lecture earnings. And then when the tax man comes by, she says, or she refuses to pay. She says, no taxation without representation. Echoes of that old tea party in the uh, Boston Harbor. Well, he says, no problem, impounds household goods and sells them at tax auction. Fortunately, these are bought by her neighbors and returned, but it's a widely publicized protest in women's rights circles. Same year, Harriet Lefetra, who's a Quaker from Shrewsbury, many but not all of the women I've been talking about are from Quaker backgrounds. Um, she leads Monmouth County residents in petitioning the New Jersey State Legislature on behalf of women's rights and women's suffrage, to which the re legislature responds that the revision of state statutes would be a task in comparison of which the labors of Hercules sink into insignificance and pointed out that the subservient role of women dates back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Evil Garden of Eden and the task of ruling government uh, in, in home and in government rightly belongs to men because of that. Well, this activi activism ceases with the Civil War and women patriotically uh, come to help uh, during that time. And they're sewing uniforms, they're doing filing and record keeping for the government. Uh, this is Clara Barton, or they're nursing soldiers. And of course, they're keeping homes, farms, and businesses going while the men go a warring. And they expect that their competence and patriotism will be rewarded after the war. They'll be disappointed bitterly. In 1866, the first women's rights convention in uh, after the war, uh, decides, the women there decide to partner with their former abolitionist buddies to form the American Equal Rights Association with its primary goal of securing equal rights, especially suffrage, to both women and African Americans. Um, and in 1867, New Jersey establishes a statewide organization which is um, uh, uh, which is founded in Vineland, New Jersey, a very progressive community. We're going to see a lot more of them. And uh, Lucy Stone becomes its first president, and she's organized um, chapters around the state. Vineland is already a hotbed bed of activism and progressive women, including one of my favorites, Susan Pecker Fowler, who was a teacher, merchant, and blueberry farmer, and single all her life, a big... Sorry about the lawnmower outside. A big uh, advocate um, of this, what's called the American costume, sometimes also called bloomers, because she said that that gave her the freedom to move around and do her professions. She also uh, followed Lucy Stone's example and wrote a protest le letter about paying her taxes for over 40 years to the um, to the local paper. And she and her friend Mary Tillotson would organize an anti-fashion convention to advocate for the, uh, the bloomers in Vineland in 1874. In any event, 1867, Lucy also publishes pamphlets uh, telling women how they, um, that, that they should have the vote and addresses the legislature urging them to strike out white and male in their in the Constitution. Addressing many of their complaints, she says women people say women will vote as their husbands and brothers do. What's the problem? Women might not want to vote. What's the problem? If women vote, they might want to hold office. Well, Queen Victoria is doing a very good job across the pond, but the legislature uh, doesn't take her seriously. The following year, she and her sister-in-law, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, petition the legislature again for voting and property rights. And this time, these times they're mocked. They're told women should not drag their shining skirts in the polluting mire of politics. And also uh, one of the legislators quips that no person's qualified to vote unless they're familiar with the appearance, sex, and size of that noble animal, the shad. And here is that fish. So now you've seen it, you can vote. 
In March of 1868, Mrs. Portia Gage in Finland decides to try to vote, but she uh, is rejected. In September, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who's recently moved to Tenafly, New Jersey, come down to uh, Finland to speak on women's vote uh, rights. And then uh, on November 3rd, 1868, 172 women, including four what were then called colored women, attempt to vote in Vineland. They're not allowed to drop their ballots in the regular ballot box, but they say, no problem, we brought our own. You can see it here, and when things open up again, you'll be actually able to visit it at the Vineland Historical Society. Uh, we know since they brought their own the ballot box that most of them voted for Grant, the Republican. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, however, got two votes and there were scattered others. And this attempt to vote was reported in Stanton and Anthony's new newspaper, The Revolution, and it would inspire others. Um, incidentally, Lucy and her mother-in-law attempted to vote in that election in Newark, but were rebuffed. The following year, Lucy creates a petition addressed to the men and women of America uh, asking that everyone sign this who's not satisfied that women, idiots, felon, and felons, and lunatics are the only classes excluded from the right of suffrage and pointing out working women are not getting fair wages, uh, the wife is not able to keep what she earns, or to have custody of her children. But on the national stage, the 14th and 15th Amendments only give the vote to black men. And furthermore, they the U.S. Constitution now qualifies the word citizen with the word male. Before that, it had been silent. Uh, it, it might have been assumed, but it wasn't explicit. Fed Frederick Douglass, that big partner with Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1848, insisting on the right to vote, he says, the Congress is, is no way going to give women the right to vote right now, and we need to get it for black men. But Sojourner Truth points out that his Negroes Hour excludes black women, saying there's a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored women theirs. And if the men get the rights and the women don't, we're just exchanging one master for another. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton fretted that if the word male be inserted, it would take a century to get it out. She's only off by 50 years. But what happens is it splits the women's rights movement. The American Women's Suffrage Association, founded by Lucy and Antoinette and others, they decide to accept the 14th and 15th Amendments as male only and work in the states and territories to try to build leverage uh, for women's votes uh, everywhere. And they get two very quick successes. Wyoming in 1869 a territory is a territory, and a territory doesn't have to put this up for a vote. They can decide it with their governor and legislature. And it, they have six to one male-female ratio, so they see it as a, as a lure to bring more wives to the territory. And Utah the following year has a different reason. Mormons who are trying to consolidate their power practice polygamy, so they might have four votes in their family, whereas the non-Mormon would only have two. And briefly, a little over a decade later, Washington uh, territory will get the vote and then lose it again over the issue of prohibition. But all of the other campaigns are unsuccessful. Meanwhile, the National Women's Suffrage Association, which is founded by uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others, they decide they're going to challenge the 14th Amendment, test it to see if they can broaden it to include uh, females as well as male. And a number of women attempt to vote in the 1872 election, including uh, many of the Vineland voters, um, Sojourner Truth in Rochester, and Susan B. Anthony, also in Rochester. Susan is arrested, and when she goes to court and attempts to testify, the judge says she's incompetent to testify. This is the woman who has been making some 300 speeches a year, but she's not allowed to speak in court, and he draws out an already written um, judgment charging her uh, with $100 for uh, illegal voting. She refuses to pay, but for a variety of reasons, it's a different case, uh, the Virginia Minor case, similar, that reaches the Supreme Court, which in 1875 rules that citizenship does not equal suffrage. Uh, that same year, New Jersey suffragists get a blow as well. After repeatedly trying to strike out both white and male in their constitution, the 1875 amendment only strikes out white. <laughs>
the following year, we have the first World's Fair held in the Americas in Philadelphia, our centennial celebration. And it's a grand celebration, um, but the National Women's Suffrage Association attempts to, uh, uh, to speak on stage and use their Declaration of Rights of the women of the United States. They were buffed, not allowed to speak, so they distribute, they hand distribute, um, they speak outside and hand distribute the document. Uh, but the American Women's Suffrage Association held, holds a, an event the previous day um, on July 3rd because July 2nd is a Sunday, the Lord's Day. And Lucy Stone's husband, Henry Blackwell, speaks and says July 2nd should really be considered our, um, our centennial because on that day we really did have suffrage for the broadest number of people in New Jersey and that should be the model for the world. I would say that the only woman who really uh, shone at that convention was made of iron and that was the arm and torch of the Statue of Liberty which was there to raise money for the pedestal. Well, two years later, the uh, 16th Amendment is introduced to Congress, identical to the 15th, except for the last word, race is changed to sex. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes that she was infuriated because the chairman of the chairman studied inattention and contempt. Women would go on to reintroduce this amendment in every Congress for the next 41 years. Well, during this time, as I said, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is living in Tenafly, and her dining room table is a center of uh, activity on women's suffrage throughout the country. And uh, she's also, along with her um, partners, Susan B. Anthony and Matilda Gage, who I don't have time to talk about today, are writing the history of women's suffrage from that table. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is trying to organize national national petition to urge the political party conventions to put women's suffrage in their platforms unsuccessfully. And uh, that November, she attempts to vote in Tenafly, New Jersey, and there is an article also in that issue all about that. She points out to the uh, elect election officials that New Jersey used to give women the vote, and they say, well, the poll inspector says, well, I know nothing about constitutions, national or New Jersey's, but I do know women don't vote. That's emblematic because there's lack of progress on suffrage around the country, and suffrage uh, women and associations lose hope and membership. Meanwhile, other outlets are, for women's energies are appearing, one of which is the Women's Club Movement, which was founded in 1869 in New York City with the Cirrhosis Club, and in 1872 the first uh, women's club was uh, established in New Jersey in Orange, and dozens more follow. And women's clubs were very, very important because members would present and discuss papers. And since there was no higher education, no college in New Jersey would accept women, this was an outlet for their intellectual activities. It also was a way for women to better their communities. They established public high schools, libraries, and other educational opportunities, especially for girls. And they saw suffrage as a way of expanding their voices in the community. Meanwhile, the religious women and the uh, became very active in a temperance movement, the Women's Christian Temperance uh, Union. As I had said, a drunk husband could abuse the, uh, uh, the wife and children. He could uh, drink up all the rent money and the food money, and the woman could not take her children out of that situation because they belonged to the husband. So uh, it was a terrible situation, and so temperance was a very powerful motivating force. And it became huge. The Women's Christian Temperance Union became enormous in this country, and Frances Il Willard became their president with her motto to do everything, not only to pray and, and to educate, but to get the vote to make a difference in legislation. And you can see in this card, she is surrounded by her political equals, these, these horrible stereotypes. Um, and so it was a big, big uh, element. It also was a, an organization that welcomed black women. Uh, they were in segregated chapters, but it was the place that black women started getting their voice as well. And these organizations change the argument for women deserve the vote because they're equal to women 
will bring morality to politics. If, uh, they'll reform society with temperance, with fair labor laws, conservation, consumer protection, and so forth. And we see something happening in New Jersey. The New Jersey uh, chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union formed a suffrage committee in 1884. And in 1887, in a huge surprise, the New Jersey legislature passed school suffrage unanim unanimously, but only for rural districts where suffrage was, um, where votes were taken in an open meeting. And there, we really don't know what happened behind the scenes on this, but there's some suspicion that this was a deal to appease temperance activists and not rile urban bosses. But nationally, the uh, competition from temperance and women's clubs led the two organizations to merge back together to get a stronger voice, and it was engineered by the daughters of the original founders. And our state societies coordinated with this new national society, and New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association uh, decided we were going to use the um, we were going to use the school suffrage as kind of a leapfrog to full state suffrage. And then in 1894, in a horrible blow, the state Supreme Court said that the school suffrage was illegal because our state constitution did not allow women to vote for people. They could vote for budgets, but not for people. Uh, we, basically, the initial reaction was sorrow, but then getting to work to get the full state suffrage, but it soon became clear that there was no votes for that, insufficient votes for full suffrage. So they decided to just try to get a suffrage amendment for school suffrage in the state. Massive, massive campaigning. It had to get through two, uh, two uh, sessions of the legislature. They got it through, and then it went to the all-male electorate. And it was thought that it wouldn't be a big deal. I mean, women are mothers. Mothers vote for school. Uh, for schools, but despite massive campaigning and endorsements from just about everybody, it was defeated and it was a huge blow. What happened nationally was a little bit similar. There were, uh, right after the merger, there were four quick successes. Wyoming came into the union as a state, uh, insisting that its women come along, would go Wyoming. Colorado became the first state to where the male voters voted to extend the franchise to women in 1893, and they also became the first state to have female legislators. And then in 1896, Idaho and Utah got, got on board. By this time, Utah no longer had, uh, no longer had uh, polygamy. But then after that, doldrums, despite dozens, dozens of campaigns and oodles of activists, thousands of them, every campaign was defeated. And we were also quiet, New Jersey, demoralized after the defeat. And our leaders died off. Lucy in 1893, Elizabeth in 1902, Susan and Aunt Susan as she was called in 1906. One of the last things Susan B. Anthony said in a public speech was that failure was impossible, but it would require a new generation of leaders to take on. And in 1908, we see two of them, two remarkable women in New Jersey. Uh, one of them is Mina Van Winkle, who founds the Equality League for Self-Supporting Women of New Jersey uh, as a parallel organization to one that has been uh, founded in New York City by Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And these organizations brought uh, working women, professionals, and wage earners into the movement, a movement that had previously been mostly white, uh, middle and upper class women of leisure. And that same year, the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association elected a tremendous president, Clara Schley Laddie, and she re-energized that organization, visiting all the local leagues, speaking uh, for lots of societies in the state, and getting the New Jersey Federal uh, Federation of Labor to endorse women's suffrage. And as I said, in 1910, she named me the enrollment chair of the organization. That same year, two other organizations were uh, formed in, the, uh, in New Jersey, the Equal Franchise Society, which brought in socially prominent men and women with their bankrolls, and the New Jersey Men's League, which brought in uh, businessmen, politicians, and religious leaders with their, uh, their, their connections. And that year, Harriet Stanton Blatch organized the first women's suffrage parade in New York City. It was a 
not a huge affair. Uh, women stood a few abreast carrying banners. There were no floats. There were no bands. But it was a very audacious act. Women did not march in the streets. In fact, Florence Foster recalled later, parading in the public streets, no lady, but we felt we must do it for the cause. And the problem was well, whether to tell our husbands before we marched or after. However, that same year, women's clubs pulled back from supporting suffrage. They were, they were outraged by the public uh, advocacy. They had been fine with suffrage when suffrage was done in parlors and in tea parties. But when it became marching in the streets and public gangs, they felt that was be like at least many, enough did that they could not get the votes in their conferences, their annual conventions to support it. And they wouldn't come back uh, till much later in the decade. Then in November of 1910, we finally had a victory. Washington became this, the fifth state to, uh, to win women's suffrage. And the following year, California would become the sixth in a very hard fought campaign, the fourth one in that uh, state. And it won by an average of only one vote for, per precinct. So anybody, anytime anyone says your vote doesn't count, say it sure does, I remember California. But what this what meant was that a moribund movement became had got momentum, and the goal of the organization was to bring at least one eastern state on board. This is where suffrage activism had begun, but there had been no victories. In January 1911, Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated as the governor of New Jersey. He was a progressive Democrat, but women's suffrage was not part of his agenda. December of that year, Emmeline Pankhurst comes. She's a militant suffrage from England, and she does a lecture tour in the United States, including uh, in Newark before 2,500 suffrage advocates there. And the four organizations are energized and determined they're going to introduce a resolution to the New Jersey legislature, which they do in January 1912. Senator Gebhardt, a uh, Democrat from Hunterdon County, introduces it on the urging of his two daughters who are active in the movement. And March 13th, 1912, that amendment goes before the Judiciary Committee and 600 people, 600 women, uh, descend on Trenton in, into the State House. And they overflow the chamber. And the supporters of suffrage speak first. Uh, Mrs. Laddie talks about their social good. Miss Melinda Scott, who's a women's labor organizer, talks about how women need this to improve their working conditions and have food pure food laws. And Char Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who you may know because she wrote the uh, Yellow Wallpaper. She's a feminist writer from California, and she, um, which as I just said, had just won women's suffrage. She points out that women need votes just as much as men would if women had been making laws for men. But the aunties are formidable, among whom are Mrs. Harriet Fisher, who was called the Iron Woman because she owned an anvil factory. She'd inherited it from her husband. She was the first woman factory owner in the United States, and she was the first woman to drive in an automobile all around the world. Nevertheless, she asserted women are being deceived in the promises held out to them under the ballot and told the New York Times, a woman's place is in the home. She was accompanied by Miss Minnie Bronson, who called herself a working woman, and she was the editor of an anti-suffrage newspaper called The Woman's Protest. But she said suffrage would actually damage protections what working women uh, had. And she would later state that women shouldn't have the vote because women would only vote for good looking men. Well, the resolution was defeated in both chambers, but it marked a new era. Women would, suffrage activists would be coming to Trenton to pressure legislators again. But it also served as a rallying cry to the anti-suffrage movement, which followed, uh, which founded the following month, the New Jersey Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And soon there were chapters across the state. Uh, in October, we held our first New Jersey suffrage uh, parade. It was a big affair, 800 to 1,000 people with brass bands and speakers and uh, lots and lots of banners. And the press noticed the event and called it the most important event in the campaign for equal rights since the inception of the movement. That November, 
I was elected president of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association at the time of my election. There were 28 leagues, 1,200 members. In the next eight years, we would grow it 100-fold to 120,000. That month, however, Woodrow Wilson was elected president of the United States, and he would be leaving the governorship of New Jersey to go to D.C. and meet his nemesis uh, at the beginning of March 1913. Who's his nemesis? Another Jersey girl, Alice Paul. She was a social worker who had gone to England to try to get her master's and PhD in political science. She didn't actually get a chance to finish that degree, but she got involved in uh, there. She would do it later. Uh, she got involved in the suffrage movement there, uh, got arrested, thrown in jail, went on a hunger strike, was force fed. And when she came back to the United States, she said, you are being too tame. You will never get suffrage unless you fight for it. Unless women are prepared to fight politically, they must be content to be ignored politically. And she and her friend, Lucy Burns, who she'd met in England, uh, start planning a, an activist movement in the United States. And they know they need publicity. So in late 1912, she, the two of them asked uh, NASA if they can revive the Constitutional Committee, which had kind of dutifully been reintroducing the federal amendment every year and watching it be tabled and then gone dormant for another uh, till the next uh, Congress. And they're told they may do it. They're given $10 seed money and told they're going to have to raise the rest, which they do. And they plan a uh, a great parade to publicize the cause on the eve of Wilson's inauguration, March 3rd, 1913. As she's planning the parade in Washington, we are back in Trenton reintroducing the referendum. And uh, in that same newspaper, you see uh, suffragists to uh, invade Trenton. General Rosalie Jones and her suffrage army, here they are, quite an army, aren't they? They were 15 suffrage hikers around the country, had assembled in New York, and were walking to Washington, D.C. in February. And here you can see it's a pretty cold walk, icy streets passing through Newark. They get to Trenton and they deliver suffrage messages to Governor Wilson and the legislature on February 18, 1913. Here, this time, 2,000 people fill this hearing. Uh, Wilson does his best to dodge the women, but this time the measure passes the Senate because we've been able to persuade them they're not voting for suffrage, they're voting to allow the all-male voters in New Jersey to vote for suffrage. Then it's off to Washington, D.C. on March 3rd. Uh, New Jersey women and men join over uh, 5,000 people from across the United States and around the world, led by New York City labor law lawyer Inez Mulholland. It's a very well-organized parade setting off down Pennsylvania Avenue, carrying banners and flags, uh, give women the vote. But half a million unruly, drunken spectators line the sides of the street, and they soon break through the barriers and crush the women. They heckle, trip, shove, uh, hurdle abuse, and actually injure the women, and the police do nothing to stop them. Ambulances have to squeeze through to reach the injured. Uh, but the result is that the suffrage amendment gains national headlines, which thrills Alice Paul. And that same week, we, win, we have success on the amendment in the assembly as well. So the summer of 1913, women, uh, people across New Jersey are campaigning for suffrage because we know we have to send it through the legislature a second time, generating publicity. And you can see this wonderful suffrage wagon. These three women uh, spent a month touring the state, living, eating, sleeping in this wagon uh, and delivering the message. We also have conventions of the New Jersey Men's League and we uh, engage the religious community in support of the amendment. But then in August, we discover that the government has failed to submit the amendment to the newspapers, which is required by law three months before the next, uh, the next election. When we find this out, we go to the governor and the legislature to try to get it corrected, but we're told, so sorry, too bad, too late. So at our convention in November, we're furious. We think, you know, the, the oversight we're sure is actually a dirty trick, but there's nothing to do about it. We're going to have to pass it again in 1914 and 15. 
Then right after our convention, we head down to Washington, D.C., because Alice Paul thinks that a convention of women from his home state might convince President Wilson to support uh, the federal amendment. We have a very hard time getting to see him. He's a master of an avoidance, but finally he does let us in and says he will give it his consideration. Very milk toast. Then it's back to Trenton in January of 1914. The legislature uh, again has the amendment introduced and this time it easily passes both uh, both chambers. And then we discover that the Senate hasn't published the results in the journal as is required, um, but this time we discovered in time. We're no longer political novices. But our opponents are also getting stronger. There are now two organizations. Uh, the female one, uh, New Jersey Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, has 15 leagues and 15,000 members. And the men's league is much smaller, but has some of the most prominent people in the state. Uh, and I, I fret, we haven't one-tenth enough active workers to carry on the present work as it should be carried on and not one-fifth enough money. The antis are very strong here and are fighting us tooth and nail. Well, the summer of 1914, we're back at the shore particularly, mobilizing interest. Um, our goal is to make sure that we get more pro-suffrage state and national uh, legislators. And then at our convention, there's a huge excitement because it's pretty clear the legislature will pass the resolution in January and we need to plan how we're going to get the all-male electorate to uh, to support it. So we, uh, we engage four paid organizers and we plan a massive campaign throughout the state. It is indeed introduced as the first bill in the 1915 session. It's easily passed and a special election is set for October 19th. The same year that New York, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts will be holding suffrage referenda election as well. And our goal is at least one for uh, leverage for the federal amendment. Their high hopes, our campaign slogan is victory in 1915, massive uh, publicity and propaganda, over a million and a half pieces of campaign literature, over half a million buttons and other, uh, uh, other propaganda. We hold parades, lectures, performances, automobile processions, fall games, anything to capture the attention and hopefully the sympathy of onlookers and male voters. We have a Cape Crusader dog and a suffrage boat on Lake Hopakong. There is a suffrage torch that is passed uh, across the Hudson from New York to New Jersey, and a suffrage camel that travels all over the state. We have lots and lots of uh, posters talking about the social good that come from women's votes. And the efforts of African Americans are particularly strong. They're organized by Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph, who had previously brought together 30 black uh, chapters of the Women Christian Tent Prince Union in New Jersey into the New Jersey Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. She had spoken out in front of the legislature and she was a very active uh, indeed. But our opposition was also active and very well funded. And they came out of that issue of moral voters. There was a lot of money coming from the liquor industry, which feared prohibition, from manufacturing, which feared that uh, laws outlawing long days and outlawing children's work and so forth would be uh, enacted if women had the vote. And political parties who felt that women were far less corruptible than men. And finally, well-off women who, like from the women's clubs, who said that it was unladylike to demand the vote. Uh, the state was flooded with flyers claiming socialism and feminism would help to lay the axe at the taproot of Christian civilization, and political bosses and liquor and manufacturing interests uh, uh, had saloons handing out tickets good for two drinks if women's suffrage is defeated. And remember, many of these voters at the time, we had a lot of immigration, a lot of people did not know how to read or write, so many of the male electorate couldn't even read the ballot they were asked to fill out so they were just told you know click you know x the top box and we will and you'll get your your, your beer finally two weeks before election day uh president wilson announced his support of the state referenda uh, we had been at him for months on this, but only as a citizen of New Jersey and not as the president or the leader of the Democratic Party, which was very disappointing, and also not for the federal amendment, only for the state amendments. And um, 
newspaper uh, journalists were cynical. They said he had to do this because we're, there were a number of Western states where women now had the vote. And if he didn't support the referendum, he'd lose their votes in the upcoming election. We didn't know what was going to happen. Newspaper coverage became very limited because of the war in Europe. And on October 19th, the New Jersey Amendment was defeated rather soundly. It was a great disappointment. And it was an ominous signal because three weeks later, the other three states also saw their amendments go down to defeat. For most of us, we couldn't even try again for years. In New Jersey, we would have to wait five years before starting the process over again. New York didn't have to wait. They'd only have to wait till the next legislature. So uh, they could try again in 1917. And the new uh, national president, Carrie Chapman Catt, announced that that was exactly what they were going to do. But Alice Paul saw this defeat as, as monumental. She said, you are wasting your time continuing on these state approaches. You need to put all your resources into the federal amendment. And she had been gathering uh, signatures across the country uh, on petitions. She had over half a million that would, uh, would be delivered to Washington, D.C. by way of uh, New Jersey. This picture is taken in New Jersey. And she also established a branch of her of her uh, National Women's Party, it would be, soon be called, in Newark, uh, head, headed by Allison Turnbull Hopkins and Julia Herbert. And they uh, rode around the state working toward publicizing the federal amendment, demanding the passage. She also decided to do some strong arm tactics. She urged women in the suffrage states to vote against all the Democrats in the 1916 election because they controlled the White House and Congress. And if they refused to include the federal amendment in their platform, then they would be defeated. This was a very problematic policy because we had pro and antis in both political parties. As I had mentioned, several of the people who were uh, introducing the amendments in New Jersey were actually Democrats. And so Carrie Chapman Catt instead at a convention in August of 1916 that was held right here in New Jersey in Atlantic City uh, announced her winning plan, which said that we needed to do both federal and state uh, actions, activities, and that we needed to support pros in both, pro legislators in both parties. Well, Wilson was reelected despite Alice Paul's efforts because he, um, his his platform was we will he kept us out of war and women very much wanted to stay out of war, uh, and so Alice Paul turned to a brand new tactic, which was to have women picket the White House starting January 9th, 1917. It was the first time anyone had ever done this. They were called silent sentinels and women volunteers came from across the country, including from New Jersey. In the bottom corner here, you see Allison Turnbull Hopkins uh, uh, protesting on New Jersey Day, which was January 30th. They initially, some people thought they were uh, admired. Some people uh, thought they were misguided or foolish. Some people brought uh, warm bricks for them to stand on. Other people um, stated they were crazy. But the mood turned really ugly April after uh, we de uh, declared war and we went to war on April 6, 1917. Uh, Harrison Stanton Blatch, who had come up with the idea of the silent sentinels, said they couldn't continue uh, at, during the time of international crisis and resigned from Alice um, Paul's organization. But Alice Paul said, no, we have to continue because President Wilson is being a hypocrite. He said, we're going to war abroad to defend democracy, but he's denying it to the 51% of the population who's female at home. But the war was radically and rapidly changing the American mood toward dissent. Uh, the U.S. Committee on uh, Patriotic Information was whipping up patriotism and uh, the new, uh, soon to be passed Espionage and Sedition Acts would soon make, uh, make speaking out against war illegal, punishable by fines or imprisonment. And it was in this atmosphere uh, that Bastille Day, July 14th, 19th, 17, a couple of dozen women marched, and the, they were led by New Jersey women party, women's uh, party leaders uh, 
Julia Herbert and Alison Tr Trumbull Hopkins, and their banners stated Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, and they were arrested and sentenced to 60 days in the Occoquan workhouse. Uh, they were pardoned by the president after three days, probably because Hopkins' husband was uh, his camp New Jersey campaign manager. But this was the start of what would become a very frequent occurrence. Uh, as the year progress, the banner rhetoric is escalating. There's a Russian banner which tells the Russian envoys that the president is, is deceiving them. There's a, a banner that addresses the president as Kaiser Wilson, saying that uh, Germany is actually more democratic because they're allowing their women to vote. This does not endear the women, and the attacks uh, become really, really bad. 500 or 1,000 people are sometimes attacking half a dozen women. But the attackers are not arrested. It's the women who are. They're charged with obstructing sidewalk traffic, the only thing they can think to do it. And for this clear misdemeanor, they are thrown into jail. Uh, and then when they ask to be treated as political prisoners, they're beaten. They're placed in solitary confinement. Uh, they are cruelly force fed. They're not allowed visitors or messages. Uh, November 1917, there's a night of terror where Lucy Burns is strung up by her wrists in handcuffs to her jailhouse doors, her cell doors all night. Another woman is hurled against the, uh, the wall and sustains a concussion. Many of the others think she's dead all night long. Uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. They're fed uh, food that is full of maggots. Uh, and, but finally, uh, newspaper, the word gets out through smuggled accounts into the newspapers, and there's a public outcry, and the administration is forced to capitulate and releases them all right after Thanksgiving. Um, three months later, four months later, uh, the court will overturn those convention, convictions, saying that uh, the mere act of assembling is not unlawful unless it's for an unlawful purpose, which is a huge victory not only for them, but for us, for anyone who wants to speak out against anything we see is wrong in our country. And if you want to hear more about their courage, I strongly recommend that you view Iron Jawed Angels. Wonderful. Um, meanwhile, while this excitement's going on, the National is pursuing uh, states, particularly New York, which they see as the really big apple in the uh, in the pie. Harriet Stanton Blatt is using war phrases, pointing out uh, posters show that uh, women are stepping up and doing all these different things for their country. They only ask enfranchisement. They hold a huge parade uh, in October with more than a million petition signatures pointing out women are in the war effort, they're buying liberty bonds, and that Wilson has endorsed the state drives. And this time they are successful. They do win in New York, bringing along the largest cache of electoral votes in the country, 45. There's all, they're also celebrating a number of states in the Midwest attain women's suffrage uh, for presidential elections, for electoral votes. We had tried to do that in New Jersey, but it didn't go anywhere. Well, women now have political power. Uh, 12, a quarter of the women in the country will be voting in 1918 and even more in 1920. Also, New Jersey women are starting to, more of them coming on board, especially the women's clubs who in 1917 uh, do join their club women in, in uh, 35 other states who endorse women's suffrage, and they elect uh, staunch suffragists as their president. So whether it's the political math, the picketers' imprisonment, a combination of both, Congress starts to take notice. And for the first time in 40 years, the amendment's going to be coming up for floor votes in both houses in January. On January 10th, uh, 1918, the 40 years to the day that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and others introduced the 16th Amendment to uh, Congress, the amendment comes to the floor of the House. And long before dawn, women are lining up to watch from the uh, galleries. They're not allowed to keep their knitting. Now, they're all knitting socks, etc., for the troops, but somebody decides that knitting needles must be dangerous weapons, so they have to put them aside. And a whole pile of knitting uh, bags 
uh, is outside. And then uh, they watch as President Wilson addresses the House, saying that we made partners of the women in this war, uh, suffering, sacrifice, and toil. We need to include them as a partnership of privilege and right. The war could not have been fought if it had not been for the services of the women. Massing, massive lobbying by both the National and the National Women's Party yields uh, exactly the vote needed. There were also heroics. Several congressmen left their hospital beds and one left his dying wife in New York to cast their vote. Great cheers, great relief. This is such excitement that we have won the first house. But of course the fight is not over. Uh, and even in New Jersey, we had a mixed delegation. So we're keeping up the pressure because we need to convince the Senate. Uh, in April 1918, there's a parade in, uh, in Newark. And in May, the New Jersey uh, State Federation of Women's Clubs passes a resolution urging the president to come on board and pressure Democratic senators. Uh, because the Senate is still 11 votes short, and 10 senators died that year. Um, this was the first wave of the Spanish flu, and seven of those deaths were among supporters, including one of the New Jersey senators, Senator Hughes. There was massive telegrams, editorials, lobbying. Finally, the Senate uh, schedules a vote for September 30th. President Wilson deans to give a speech um, asking that they consider the bill as a war uh, measure, but it is defeated by two votes. That fall, there's a special election to uh, to uh, get a replacement senator for our uh, for Senator Hughes, and we've worked very hard to get a pro senator in place, but we fail. Um, and, Sen uh, and Senator Baird is is the uh, lame duck senator. And in the, that session, they hold one more vote in the Senate, and it loses by one vote. So had we been successful, uh, it would have gotten through Congress a few months earlier. Nevertheless, on May 19, 1919, the 66th Congress was convened, and the pro-suffrage vote around the country, the women who had the vote at this point, meant that the House easily uh, passed the amendment this time. There was no no need for heroics. But there was a lot of debating and de uh, delaying in the Senate because the antis knew the longer they went, the more le state legislatures would be out of session and the harder it would be for women to uh, uh, get the amendment passed before the 1920 elections. Lots of lobbying. Finally, on J June 4, 1919, the 19th Amendment passes the Senate. But of course, it's not over yet. We still need 36 state legislatures to ratify. And as I said, many uh, governors were reluctant to call special sessions. It would turn into a 14-month struggle. Our neighbors in the 1950 referendum, they all passed it that summer very quickly, ratified it. But it was more of a challenge in New Jersey. We didn't think we had the votes at that point. So that fall, there was an extensive campaign urging New Jersey residents to citizens to work and vote for pro-candidates. And in uh, September, we announced our support of the Democratic candidate for governor, Edward Edwards, because the Republican candidate had not committed to the amendment. And we worked very hard and were very excited when he won the election. January 1920, the new legislature convened and uh, the Senate easily passed uh, the amendment on February 2nd. But the assembly looked much dicier. There were a lot of last minute attempts to derail the vote. There was a letter from a real man to a politician, as it was headlined, calling women's suffrage the greatest menace, now threatening the stability of American government. But on February 9th, late in the evening, the roll call began and it continued into the early hours of uh, February 10th, when finally the result of the roll call was 34 to 24, basically because a, a group of Essex County led, uh, legislators moved from the ante to the pro column. And there was just immense relief and cheering from our spectators gallery. Well, the antes did not give up. They urged the governor to veto. He said, uh, I'm not interested in doing it, and besides, I can't. That's not the way this works. And he instead uh, cabled that he had had the pleasure of approving the resolution and was sending it on to Washington. And here you see the great-great-whatever-grandfather of, of Senator Freeling, Heisen, uh, 
congratulating uh, Betty Graham on the ratification. On April 23, 1920, we held a grand victory celebration in Newark, and we converted the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association into the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of New Jersey. I became treasurer of that organization, and Carrie Chapman Catt had become the uh, national president. But this might have been premature because this fight wasn't over yet. We had our 35th win uh, legislature in uh, win in March, but then it slowed to a stop. Delaware, Connecticut, and Vermont failed to ratify the um, amendment, and most of the South would not consider because of the issue of race. It appeared to, that Tennessee would, was our only hope. And in August of 1920, 56 different groups of suffragists uh, and anti-suffragists descended on Nashville, the Hermitage Hotel, to lobby the legislators. It easily ratified the Senate there, but in the House it looked very dicey indeed. Indeed, it looked like there might be a tie, uh, a tie that would mean defeat for the amendment and for all of our hopes. And then on the day of the vote, when the roll call came to Harry Byrne, a senator who represented a very conservative part of the state, he voted aye. And everybody screamed. Well, it took a few minutes to realize what had happened. Well, we realized that we had won. There was enormous excitement. Um, and later on, he escaped. Apparently, he fled the chamber, worried he was going to get beaten up by the antis. But later on, we learned that he'd received a letter that morning from his mother, who was a staunch suffragist, urging him to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. And he always said it was a good idea to listen to your mother. And uh, a week later, August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was officially certified in Washington. It had gotten the nickname the Anthony Amendment because, of course, it had moved up numbers as the uh, other amendments got passed in between, and it was officially adopted. It had been 72 years since Seneca Falls, 144 years since Abigail Adams. There had been 480 campaigns in state legislatures, 56 state referendums, 57 attempts to add suffrage to state constitutions, 19 campaigns for a federal amendment, and 19 different Congresses to win women the right to vote, a voice in America's government. And this chart can show you when women got the vote and you realize that uh, New Jersey and some of our neighbors, we women did not get it until that amendment was passed. But I should say some women, because Native Americans weren't citizens and couldn't vote until 1924, and many states prevented them for decades longer. Utah didn't guarantee them of the vote until 1962. Chinese Americans couldn't vote until 1943. Japanese Americans till 1952. And many states used poll taxes, literacy tests, threats of violence, which effectively prevented many African Americans and other quote, undesirable voters from voting until the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which tragically was eviscerated a few years ago by the Supreme Court. The last state to ratify the 19th Amendment didn't do so until 1984. Mississippi has that uh, dubious distinction. Only one pioneer suffragist lived long enough to cast her vote, and that was Antoinette Brown Blackwell, uh, who lived in Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey. She had um, she had been a founder, a co-founder with Lucy of New Jersey's suffrage movement. She had, of course, been to that first national convention, and uh, she was a 95-year-old great-grandmother when she cast her very happy vote. We're still striving for equality. Uh, as of today, uh, well, as of this current Congress, there have been 358 women in Congress versus almost 12,000 men, uh, and we're uh, less than 24% of the voting members versus 51% of the population. We still have not had a woman president or vice president, but as of Tuesday, it looks like there's a much greater chance that we will have that break through that glass ceiling for the first time with Kamala Harris. Uh, she... Uh, along with many in the 116th Congress are the faces of a new diversity in our government. You see uh, women of different nationalities, of different religions, of different backgrounds.
but that's not uh, equally distributed. You can see that in the last Congress, the GOP elected one wo woman, one new woman, whereas the Democrats elected far more and, and many more African Americans as well. Indeed, the Democratic delegation is now 37% women. The Republicans are only 9% women. A flip from the early day when the Republicans were, were more the party of, of, um, of reform. And we still have a way to go in our in expectations for our children. These are actual covers of September 2016 issues of Girls' Life and Boys' Life. So you need to vote. Use that vote, that hard fought for vote. Uh, organize, volunteer, run for office. I did all of those things. Uh, in the early 1920s, as I said, I was a treasurer of the League of Women Voters, but I left that after one year to decide to work in party politics. I organized women for the Republican Party for the first half of the 1920s. I worked on legislation uh, urging political parties to be equal number male and female, to have women on all juries, to have women on state boards, and to pass laws that would prevent women from working at night. But I broke with the Republican Party because I felt they were being dishonest and inefficient, and they broke with me. I was ousted um, from the state committee in 1925. That same year, my husband filed for divorce. He'd been supportive of, of me when I was working on women's suffrage, but less so, he claimed, when I became a political animal. He said I was neglecting him. It looks like somebody else was filling in the, my place because six weeks after our divorce, he married his secretary. I uh, did run for office in 1928 as a dry pro-prohibition candidate in the Republican primary uh, for Senator of New Jersey, but did not win the nomination and left political life after that. I would die 17 years later at the age of 67. Now I wanted to share with you a little fun film that was uh, broadcast almost 50 years ago celebrating the 50th anniversary of suffrage. Now you have heard of women's rights and how we try to reach new heights if we're all created equal. That's us too. Yeah, but you will probably not recall that it's not been too long at all since we even had the right to cast a vote. Well, sure, some men bow down and call us Miss L. Yeah. Let us hang the watch out and wash the dishes. Uh -huh. But when the time rolls around to elect a president, what did they say, sister? What did they say? They said, oh, see you later, alligator. And don't forget my, my, my mashed potatoes, cause I'm going downtown to cast my vote for president. Hey. 
So as I said at points during this program, there's a full issue of the Garden State Legacy, which is an online magazine of history of New Jersey, devoted to women's suffrage in the state, including articles on suffrage for all, the uh, role of African Americans, immigrants, uh, Jewish women in the suffrage struggle, uh, the uh, anti-suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton's uh, attempt to vote, the suffrage to torch, the petticoat electors, and my overview article called Reclaiming Our Voice, which looks at the whole, the whole long stretch, the whole long struggle. It also includes some poems by the very talented Susanna Rich from her collection Shout. Uh, and you can find that as well as all of my other uh, books and programs at my website, tellingherstories.com, where there is a downloadable copy of Remembering the Ladies from Patriots and Petticoats to Presidential Candidates, so you can look at or download individual pages, and uh, also descriptions of my other programs right here. And I just want to end with this wonderful poem. Those of you who were here last week heard it as well, but I just think it's it's right on. And it's a poem that was written by Alice Dewar Miller, who was a columnist, a newspaper columnist, and uh, published poems about suffrage. And here's how it goes. Father, what is a legislature? A representative body elected by people of the state. Are women people? No, my son, criminals, lunatics, and women are not people. Mother, what is a feminist? A feminist, my daughter, is any woman now who wants to think about her own affairs as men don't think she ought her. So I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon, and I'm now available if there's any questions that have come up or comments that you want to share. Uh, we certainly are in an election where women's votes are going to be critical. Uh, for a long time after uh, for the first uh, five years or so after women got the vote, the mostly, almost entirely male legislatures paid attention to women's issues and passed a lot of women's laws because they thought women were paying attention. And then by the mid-1920s, they realized women were pretty much voting the same way that their men folk were, and you saw that go away. And so uh, it's only been in the last few decades that there's been a significant difference in the way women and men vote. And that matters. We need it for representation, and we need them to be paying attention to our needs. So uh, I do hope that everyone does vote. I'm sure in this group I'm preaching to the, to the uh, convinced already, to the choir, that our votes are critically important. Uh, however we vote, we need to speak out for our interests. So again, thank you so much for having me. Does anybody have any comments or questions or queries or anything else? Please feel free to unmute. If you want to offering, and if you'd like to see everyone else, and then we could see that. everyone else if you do good. that. Stop sharing. There we go. And then everyone should pop up again. So there you could go. say your goodbyes. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Well, I'm just delighted to have been invited, as I said. Um, it, it, Mary Grace and, and, and Louise, it's just been wonderful to do things for Sussex uh, again, and it's great to see some of the same people I saw last week and some new people as well.